there. We're, we're trying to really uh, take biblical archaeology and uh, make a heavier emphasis, uh, especially on TV presentations, documentaries, and things like that. We, we're trying. Uh, we're trying to get there. But tonight, we didn't come to talk about me. We came to talk about uh, the world, the cultural world that surrounds the Bible. Let me see. I learned to use this one, so I've got to hold it. And I'm holding it, but it's doing nothing. Let's hold it. Uh, there you go. Oh, but it went too far. Let's see. Hold it down. Okay. Oh, all right. Let's see. Point to the dot. All right. Anyways. Yeah, okay. So, in, in the area of archaeology, there are two, two camps, and they, they tend to attack each other. Just like, you know, in the Adventists, you have the conservatives versus the progressive, and they, they tend to, which is, is not a real thing. Everybody has something about conservatives and something about progressives. So, but there's two camps in archaeology when it comes to the validity of the biblical text. One camp is called the minimalist. Uh, those are the ones who minimize any historical validity of the text. So the stories didn't happen, uh, the events are not true, they are etiological, they, they, just, they are just political propaganda, and any evidence that surfaces, it is usually used against the biblical text, or it is reinterpreted to not fit the biblical text. On the other spectrum, you have what is called the maximalist. Obviously, those are who maximized, uh, for the lack of a better word, the historical validity of the biblical text. And you have some extreme there, so I'm very sure you guys have heard about somebody called Ron White. Okay. We're not going to discuss Ron White here, but that is the wrong way of, you know, that's the, the very extreme thing that uh, you um, name, that you have discovered in 10 years, anything or everything that nobody else has discovered in hundreds and hundreds of years. And then when you do an investigation and a search, you found that those claims are fraudulent. So, but that's the other extreme. In the middle ground, Andrews University and, and the Ventus archaeology in general have tried to, to stay factual to their discoveries, but also true to the biblical text. And at the end, it's really an issue of perspective. Now, some of the strongest minimalists, uh, uh, you just passed, you already saw the picture of Kathleen King. She was a British archaeologist who, uh, did she make a lot of contributions to the field. Indeed, most of the methodology that we use today as far as excavating comes from her uh, contribution to the field. But perhaps for tonight, the most important aspect is that she excavated the city of Jericho. Okay? And when she excavated Jericho, uh, in her excavation report, she said that she concluded that at the time where the walls came tumbling down, there was probably one lady cooking a soup, and when she heard the trumpets, she dropped the, the soup and just started running away because she found no walls that dated to the time of Joshua. Okay? Uh, Israel fin uh, Finkelstein is a Israeli archaeologist, and he's uh, the, the main voice of the minimalist uh, in archaeology. Indeed, he's so minimalist that sometimes he upsets minimalists. <laughs> so he really he goes to, to a very uh, extreme agenda. And obviously anything that is before the seventh century, you're talking about the, the time of uh, Hezekiah, Omri, all those kings, he considers to be just political propaganda, not real, didn't happen. Okay. Um, and then you just passed the picture of William uh, Deaver. Now, William Deaver, um, I'm told that he used to be called the Antichrist, uh, a nickname that they put, because he really uh, 
uh, made a lot of claims that were um, for the Christian conservative person were very offensive, very, very challenging. Indeed, he wrote a whole book uh, titled did God, Does God or Did God Have a Wife? And um, some people take it as, oh, he's, he's invalidating the text. Not really. But William Deaver had an interesting change in mind after his excavations in the city of Gezert. And we'll get to that in a, in a little bit, actually tomorrow, when we talk about David and Solomon. But uh, after the archaeological evidence, before he then believed in a historical David, but after his own excavations, then he changed his mind and actually now supports the validity of a historical figure called David. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Mm. So, <laughs> learning this. So there's two questions that I want to ask. Does archaeology prove the Bible? And that is, that is a big, big question. Because most people want to come to seminars and see the evidence that, yes, we found the Ark of Noah, or we found the Ark of the Covenant, or we found evidence that supports these events that most people believe to be uh, some kind of myth that somebody created in the ancient world. So the reality is that we need to perhaps ask the correct question, which is, does the Bible need to be proven? Do we need to prove the Bible? I mean, it's, 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 it's a very pondering question. It's a very pondering question, especially in today's uh, society, in which the amount of challenges and criticism towards the text is increasing. If any of you has uh, kids, I mean like sons, daughters, granddaughters, any relatives going to any university, they're going to be bombarded uh, with statements that will really challenge their faith. My wife is, is now doing... Um, a degree on respiratory therapy, and she had to take a class on psychology. No idea why. But anyways, so she took the class, and the first statement that the professor said in her class was, so how many animals did Noah bring into the ark? Right? You know, obviously, the, 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 the students were like, well, yeah, we don't know how many, but by pairs, two by two, you know, some seven, some. And at the end, he said, none, because it didn't happen. So, you know, this question is very significant for us today. Because at the end, the Bible is really a book of faith. Now, I cannot prove archaeological things like the resurrection. I cannot prove archaeologically, uh, for instance, Elijah praying and, and, and the, the piece of iron still just floating. You know, we, we cannot really trace exactly the spot where the Hebrews crossed the Red Sea. We, we, we don't have that. So to try to use archaeology just to prove the Bible, it is not only a misuse of the information, but it's also a misunderstanding on the text. However, however, the opposite is also true. I cannot use archaeology to just disprove the biblical text. Indeed, whether you are a maximalist or whether you are a minimalist, the Hebrew writings are still primary text that help us not only analyze or interpret what is found on the field, but even look for historical biblical sites. Now, what I want to do tonight, though, is give you a little... Uh, a little piece of some of the challenges that have been raised by critical scholars that in light of further discoveries have proven to be mistaken. I'm talking about minimalist scholars. So let's start with the first one. Now, 
all of you guys are acquainted with the famous Hittites. Okay, they, there's a lot of references in the biblical text about the Hittites. For instance, in Genesis 26, it tells that Esau also took uh, as his wife, Barry the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So even from the book of Genesis, you see the Hittites coming. Now, all of these statements were considered by most scholars to be fake because there was not any proof outside the scripture that this nation actually existed. In Exodus uh, 3a, we also see the Hittites mentioned along with the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Not only that, in Joshua, okay, Joshua 9.1, it reads as follows, and it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan in the hills and in the lowland and in all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Jebusite heard about it. So again, it's listed with these nations. Uh, in Second Kings, we also have another mention of the Hittites as the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites. So here's a, 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 a rojo, a government agreement between two nations, and one of those nations is named as the Hittites. Obviously, we know all the famous story about David and his affair with uh, Bersheba, who was the wife of Uriah, who was the Hittite. So for many years, critical scholars use this reference of the Hittites to say, you see, you cannot take the biblical text seriously because all this is made up. There is no evidence outside the biblical text that supports the existence of this nation. However, in 1914, there were some archaeological um, excavations in uh, an Assyrian colony of Kutelpe. Now, the first evidence of the existence of the Hittites did not come from the Hittites themselves, but from the Assyrians, because they were, they were found ancient documents, Assyrians, that talk about this colony and the treatments that were made between the Assyrians and the inhabitants of the land of Hatti. Now, after that, obviously more excavations were conducted, and not only we discover a nation that was actually named as the Hittites, or the inhabitants of the land of Hatti, but now we know that they actually inhabit the entire area of Anatolia, today in modern Turkey. And they had a very sophisticated system of life. They had temples like this one. It's called the outdoors or the outside temple with paved streets, uh, very sophisticated economy with storehouses in these temples. They even had cities designed with cave roots to be able, in, in case they got conquered, they could actually escape into the forest. So it was a very well standardized organized city. Royal houses. Uh, that you can see even an entire religion that was followed by this land with, this is a temple within the rocks in the city of Hattusha in Turkey. And uh, you can see uh, how they, their deities, along with the kings, are portraying, performing different rites and services. And not only that, but as uh, more research and more evidence surface, it was discovered that they actually went, were the main world rival power against the Egyptians. Indeed, the first international peace treaty ever made was made between the Egyptians and the Hittites. This is the Hittite version, and you have also in Karnak, in Egypt, uh, we also have an, a version of not only the Hittites being, the, uh, being defeated, according to the Egyptians, but also a copy of the same international treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians. So you have a Hittite version and you have an Egyptian version. And if that is, if that is not enough, even in the United Nations, 
there is a whole replica of this treaty that is the basis of all the other treaties that today are made between the nations. Yet, the minimalist, the critical scholar said, oh, there is no evidence outside the text. And here comes an important principle uh, for us. And it is that the absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Just because you have not seen it doesn't mean it's not there. But what about the city of Solomon and Gomorrah? Now, all of us are acquainted with these famous stories. You know, here comes Lot, he lived in these corrupted cities, uh, and then eventually uh, these cities uh, become very inhospitable towards him and the angels. God decides to, to destroy them, and then fire came from heaven, and boom! There you go. They ceased to exist. Now, obviously, this, if there is one story that, except for the flood, if there is one story that the critic, critic says, no, yes, that never happened, it's precisely this one. I mean, fire from heaven? Have you ever seen fire from heaven? Nobody has, except for fireworks, and they come from the earth towards the heaven. <laughs> so, you know, indeed, uh, most of the scholars, including Hermann Gunkel, consider this traditional story as a poor mythological tale. Okay? Also, you also have uh, Gerald von Rath, who argued that the story is etiological and that the later ruins, Israel has had some ruins near the Dead Sea, and tied it to already existing legend or invent a story to explain these ruins. So that's how the story came to the Bible. So they saw these ancient ruins, and they said, well, that's, no, they, they made up the story, and they put it in the Bible. Now, interestingly enough, okay, uh, we had actually, well, before that, uh, most, most people, most ancient people believe that these cities were under the Dead Sea, for obvious reasons, maybe. If you can see them, they must be hidden, okay? Indeed, there are ancient maps uh, that show that Strabo, the Greek historian, also argues that these cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, were uh, flooded or were under the Dead Sea as well. But, and ancient maps, like this one, shows, uh, you can see on the, on the center, and on the north, you can see uh, the Dead Sea, and you can see Sodom and Gomorrah very represented there, also, this version from uh, 1462 mentions this city under the Dead Sea. Uh, again, this is from 1950, from Thomas Fuller Atlas, uh, shows this map in which these two cities are located under the sea. However, today, most scholars, criticals, and uh, minimalists and maximalists consider that there are five sites that can be equated to these cities involved in this particular story. One of them is the city of Babadra. Okay, Babadra is on the shores, of, not necessarily on the shores, but near the Dead Sea. And what is very interesting, and I'll show you why he came to this conclusion, is that one critical scholar, Dr. Walter Rast, suggested that Babadra and other neighboring sites inspired the Sodom and Gomorrah stories in the Bible that were later written much later. Now, there's a reason why he concluded, why he suggested that, and it has to do with archaeological excavations, which I'll show you in a second. Obviously, other conservative scholars like Brian Wood and most of the SDA uh, scholars uh, agree that these cities are the most logical candidates for Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'll show you why. In about 1965, 1967, Dr. Paul Lapp uh, started excavations in Babadra, which is on the southeast shore of the Dead Sea, and they continue in 1873 by Walt Ross. Again, these are critical scholars. They're not conservative scholars. Uh, 1973, sorry, 1973. Uh, now, this is a plant of a city uh, you can see that the, uh, the whole city is uh, near the Dead Sea, around uh, the city. Now, the city was actually 
to the early bronze, okay, precisely around the time in which Abraham and Lot will actually have uh, their story will have happened. Now, what is interesting is that the entire now this is not just one area. In, in, in Tel Jalul, where I'm doing my dissertation on, you know, we found destruction by fire as layers, probably about five, ten centimeters, and that implies a major destruction. You can imagine everything being compressed because of things being built on top, so the ash layers are being reduced. So five centimeters of ash layers that is continuing in one area it implies a significant destruction. In Babadra, the entire city, the entire city, the whole thing, had significantly thick as lace. You're talking about several feet thick. Let me show you. Okay? Again, this is the Dr. Randall Price standing in Babadra. You can see some of the ancient drawings there. Uh, these are some of the walls that were found uh, in Babadra. You can still go there to the ancient site and, and see these walls. The pottery that was found in Babadra dates precisely to the time of Abraham and, and, and Lot. And then you can see the ash layers uh, within the whole city. You can see how you can see the, the light color on the top and you see kind of the, the darker color on the, on the uh, meter stick. You can see how thick these are. Only a huge, massive fire could cause this kind of destruction. Not only that, but also they found uh, fra carbonized fragments of uh, pottery, bodies, everything, that shows that they were actually burned very significantly. And uh, in addition to that, this is the Mount of Abedra, no photo of the excavation. This is the aerial uh, view of the site, of, so, of some of the ruins of the site. Across to it, there's a large cemetery that has thousands of burials. Now, not all the burials date from the time of Abraham. Okay? But it's very significant that the site eventually became an ancient cemetery for the locals. Um, they were formed by shaft kind of tools, so this kind of round structure. And then inside those, they were actually about six uh, feet deep and about three feet wide. And inside, it opens the chamber to uh, several other uh, tombs. So you have this main entrance, and inside you have these little chambers. I think I have a picture here uh, coming soon. Again, the pottery, a lot of the pottery dated to the time of Abraham. And in one tomb only, it contained about 250 bodies uh, in these chambers. And a lot of these bodies were also burnt as well, especially the ones that were buried, that had pottery dating to the time of uh, Abraham. Uh, this is uh, uh, Donald Ornert, uh, kind of uh, looking at the, uh, the excavations, uh, some of the tombs. These are some of the artifacts that were found, a picture of the tombs with the bones and the and the pottery found in it. And this is the way the, the tombs were actually formed. So you have a central entrance, usually blocked by a stone, and then once you go down, then you have these little chambers in which you put the bodies along with the pottery, and a lot of them actually have pottery dating to the time of Abraham. Now, it is interesting that during the last phase of the excavations in Babedra, uh, several of the bodies that were placed in these charnel houses, about 400 of them, were found to be completely burned. So not only you have a huge ash layered throughout the entire city, but now you have a cemetery that is formed, that, that, that have bodies that were buried during the time of Abraham that were actually burned. But also, even the charnel houses that you found in this city actually were, were also burned as well. So you have massive destruction, massive burned in the entire city of Babadra, just southeast of the Dead Sea. Uh, again, this is a map. You can see there where Moab and Edom and uh, Ammon towards the north, and you see where Babadra is on the shore of the Dead Sea. 
And then you see another important site called Numera. Now, again, most of these cities have been identified as follows. Babadra with Sodom, Numera with Gomorrah, Safar with Sword, Faifa with Atmath, and then Kanazai with Seboim. Uh, you can see, you can look at the stories. Those these cities are related to the same story. Now, again, Walter Rass, who does not take the Bible story in straightforward fashion, as conservative readers might, he does see a connection. For him, the destruction of the early bronze Babedra became the foundation for the Sodom saga, which was borrowed and adapted by the Israelites much later as a good example of historical critical interpretation. So it is interesting, again, that here a critical scholar sees a connection between the two because of the archaeological evidence. The only thing we don't have is a sign that says, welcome to uh, uh, Sodom. But the evidence is so compelling that even minimalist archaeologists do see a connection. And again, the destruction is, is massive. But also, there was another story, we, we are another connection with another important city. Because we like uh, Sodom, but what's the other city? Gomorrah. Gomorrah. Okay, so what about Gomorrah? Now, one of our own scholars, William Chea, uh, was able to find uh, etymological connections between the name of Gomorrah and the name of a very important site called uh, Numera. I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. Okay, so he suggested that there's a linguistic connection in the Hebrew Gomorrah, how it's spelled, and in the Arabic name Numera, uh, because of the substitution of a couple letters, Ayun by a Nund. Now, it is interesting the ruin of Numera also are uh, south of the Dead Sea. They also have excavation, we, they perform excavations in Numera, and they found a city that also dated to the same time of Abedra. So we're talking about the early bronze occupation. So it was occupied during the time of Abraham. Uh, you can see some of the walls. Uh, that are found in Numera, and it's interesting that in, in the occupational layers, Numera was destroyed twice, as was Gomorrah. Okay, same, same idea. Uh, and there were 20 seasons of occupation between the two destructions and 20 years between destructions. So the correlations between the occupational layers of the site fits very nice. It was occupied during the time of Abraham. There is a linguistic connection between Numera and Gomorrah. And also the two destructions that are accounted in the biblical text are also accounted in the archaeological record. Uh, even more, you know, in the charnel houses also that were found in Numera were also burned just as it was in Babadra with also uh, massive thick layers of ash. Now, I cannot stand here and tell you we have definite proof that these two are Sodom and Gomorrah. But if a critical scholar sees a connection, and the only thing that impedes him to make the claim is his perspective, I have to go and say, well, the absence of evidence is no evidence for absence. But Let's talk about early Israel. Okay, more, again, most critical scholars do uh, think that late Israel, yes, that was historical. But before, no, 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 not necessarily. However, there are a few monuments that do mention Israel. One that everybody pretty much agrees is the Merneptah Stila. Now, Merneptah, you can, uh, it's a pharaoh that actually uh, ruled around 1200 BCE. And he builds Estela to kind of boast about his military conquest. And among the nations that he mentioned that he conquered uh, is precisely the uh, mentions the land of Israel. Now, one of our scholars, Michael Hassel, did a research precisely on the spelling and the use of the determinative to identify nations, and he concluded that the use of the determinative in the stella does correlate as Israel being mentioned as a nation. This is about 200 years 
later uh, from the traditional day of the Exodus, around 1450 BCE. But not only that, recently uh, there was a proposal by two scholars, two Egyptologists, uh, Manfred Gort and Christ um, uh, Peter van der Veen and Christopher Face. Now they found a pedestal dated to Amenhotep II earlier than Bernefta, you're talking about 1400 BCE, 1450. Uh, and when they read the toponym, the so toponym is a pictographic depiction of an area. And what you have is, uh, usually they tend to mimic the outlook or the appearance of the nation being conquered. And then inside the cartouche, which is the little hieroglyphic, uh, tube that you see inside, then you spell the name of the nation that is being conquered. Now, one of those spellings, even though it's, it's kind of broken, uh, they identify as actually reading the nation of Israel. Even, even further, you can see how they are portrayed with the hand ties on the back, and that is a typical portrayal of nations that Egyptians actually have enslaved. Now, this is very nice because it dates to very close the time where the exodus actually happened. But in addition to that, there are several inscriptions. One of them is a solemn inscription BCE that mentions a very interesting people, the Shashu of Yahweh. Now, most scholars do translate or interpret the term Shashu to mean nomads, so nomadic nations. But what is very interesting is the association with these nations with the worship of a name, Yahweh, which is found in scripture to be a very intimate name for the God of Israel. So here again, you have evidence that supports a possible earlier existence of the nation of Israel. And what is very nice, that all these evidence are very close to the time of the Exodus. But let's continue on in the story of Israel. You know, they didn't stay in Egypt, they left, they went into Canaan, and as they were entering Canaan, there is a very famous story that actually we all know. Remember the story of Balaam. Now, Balaam we know because he was crazy enough to argue with a animal, a donkey, okay? that would be a story that most people would consider, you know, a theological or that's, who, who talks to an animal? O, o, only Dr. Doolittle, you know? However, in excavations at a site in Jordan on Moabite land called their Allah, they found a very interesting inscription in a very small shrine. Now, their Allah is located north of the Dead Sea and west uh, of the Jordan River, uh, you can see also it's north of the, well, the river Jabbok is where you have the story of Jacob fighting with the angel. That's where it actually happened. Uh, and it's Ammonite territory in the area of Gilead. However, their Allah has been identified mostly with the Moabite uh, culture. Now, excavations in the Allah have been conducted for a very long time. The ones that some of the earliest excavations, this is a view from the north of the site. And this is a plan of the excavation of the site itself of their Allah. It shows occupation during the Iron Age and a lot of Egyptian influence in it. Now, in 1987, uh, excavations, when they were looking towards the north, they know a road that actually came all the way to the tail. And uh, in addition to that, they also found, again, a very small shrine that had collapsed, the whole, the whole building had collapsed, the structure had collapsed, and that collapse allows to preserve an inscription found right in situ. Now, the inscription dates much later to the time of Balaam, but it was plastered on the walls, it was, it was very significant, and it is usually uh, it's assumed that it was the building by uh, an earthquake. Okay, here's a closer picture of the shrine, uh, where, the, where the scripture was found, kind of a dry, and you can see where 
the inscription would have been actually inscribed on the wall. Obviously, this is an artist's reconstruction of the shrine, and that will, that will be significant because it will highlight the importance of this person, of this inscription. And in the inscription, after they remove it, they found two things. They found the name Balaam, and over there on the top, and they also found the name Prophet. So Balaam was considered a prophet even years later, after the event that is recorded in Scripture. That tells you that earlier on, Balaam, in, among the Ammonites and the Moabites, was considered a very important prophet, related especially to the cultic activities of these two nations. So again, you have in the, in the scripture, you have Balaam tagging, tagging to a donkey, and then now you have an inscription that dates later, but supports the earlier tradition of this person being not only historical, but also associated with the role of a prophet or a cultic role, just as it is stated in the scripture. And there's also a sphinx on top of the inscription that, again, shows the influence of uh, the Egyptian culture in this area. So we have the Balan inscriptions, and I'm going to move here quick. Now, recent excavations, we go now to the time of Joshua, okay? And I'm pointing out really quick about an important excavation that is being conducted as, as, as we speak, I mean, currently, and uh, is Shiloh. Now, Shiloh appears in several texts. In Joshua 18, it is uh, identified as a place where they set up the tabernacle of the congregation before they actually conquer the land of Canaan. In Psalm 78, so lament, it says, he abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among humans. He sent the ark of his mind to captivity, his splendor into the hands of enemy. So from the time Israel entered the land, until the time of Samuel, the Ark of the Covenant was precisely located in the city of Shiloh. So when you go into the excavation of Shiloh, you expect to find something related to the cult of the religion that was practiced there. Well, here's our review of the site in Shiloh. Uh, this an American excavation, uh, as well as Danish excavations. Uh, among the findings in Shiloh was a scarab from Tomosus III. Now, Tomosus III ruled from about 1458 to about 1425. He is the, the sixth king of Egypt's 18th dynasty, and he is the one who makes really angry at a queen slash pharaoh, Hatshepsut. So he tries to eradicate everything, and some people associate to Moses III with the Pharaoh of the story of the Exodus, okay? So we found, uh, they found, not we didn't excavate there, they found very strong evidence for the site being occupied during the time of the Exodus. Uh, but what is most interesting is that not only, and I'm, I'm taking this from a presentation that I heard uh, the excavator actually give at Andrews University, not only they found a, a area, a rectangle area, a, a kind, of, a kind of like a floor that fits the measurements precisely of the tabernacle and the position that is described where the tabernacle was placed, but also they find these little ceramic uh, pomegranates. Now, pomegranates were very famous, um, I mean, were very used in different various cults. I mean, uh, they were used, in, especially in cults that dealt with fertility, like Ishtar or Ashera, they were, they were used there. Okay, so they were not unique for the Israelite cult. However, in the text, in the biblical text, we find pomegranates associated with the priestly garments to the point that they were actually were hanging from the priestly robes, a bell and a pomegranate. Now, this is very unique because these ceramic pomegranates, you can see that they have a little hole. So they will be used precisely to be hanged somewhere, and they found several of these. Some of them were found, which is very interesting, by Israel uh, Finkelstein's in earlier excavations. Now, he didn't, he didn't identify as a pomegranate because the bottom part was missing, but when they found these ones, and they related this one, they compared this one to the one that he found before, they concluded that they were pomegranates. 
Now, what is most interesting for me, though, and again, uh, Exodus, you can see the text there that also associates it too. What is more interesting for me is that uh, what is not found there. Now, I, I've done research in ancient religion sites, particularly in Kirby Atterwoods. So I know the type of cultic material that you, are, that you usually find, like hair noise and figurines and uh, anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figures that are represented like bases with bull faces that you find in these Transjordan and Cisjordan, Canaanite, Moabite, Ammonite sites. Now in Shiloh, all this typical repertoire of cultic material is missing. It's not there. Now there needs to be further excavations to be conducted. But so far, they haven't found the same type of material. Now another site, Kirbe Kayafa, which we'll talk about tomorrow, have a similar characteristic. Okay? But what about the times of the kings? Okay? So this is earlier before uh, you know, the kings of Israel. Now we're coming to the time where there's a monarchy inside Israel. So we'll talk about David and Solomon tomorrow. So tomorrow, after worship, do not miss the presentation. Okay? Because we're going to talk about if David was actually a historical figure or not. However, let's talk about the period itself. Now, there's been arguments by a lot of minimalist scholars that Jerusalem was not really organized as a capital, as, as a city-state during the time of the monarchy, as uh, the biblical text argues, especially from David on. However, recently they found a temple seal that mentions that it belongs to the governor of the city. The seals are pretty much the signatures, okay? That were used, what you today sign something at this seal, it goes. Well, that's what they used to. So they were putting documents, sometimes in clay, sometimes in, in wax, okay, to seal uh, scrolls. And that would contain the uh, signature of the person in charge. But yet they found a seal that is about um, 2,700 years old that belongs to the temple in Jerusalem. And then also mentions a governor showing that at least during the 7th century, you have actually proved that there was a political system going on in, uh, in the city. But one of the arguments that has been uh, raised is Hezekiah. Now, there's been many evidence about Hezekiah, but they always were found outside of context, so in, in the market area, never inside the excavation of Jerusalem. However, in about 2015, Dr. Elliot Mazar, who is an Israeli archaeologist, announced that he found in the system, in the excavations of Jerusalem, in undisturbed area, a seal that contained the following uh, translation. On the top, uh, you can see a little thing that looks like a little Christmas... Um, oh, God. The thing that you... Huh? Un bastoncito. Uh, a cane, okay? You see the cane? That's the letter Hebrew, lamet. It's usually translated as to or belonging to. Then you have the name Hezekiah, and on the bottom you have three letters, Melech and then Yisrael, found right in situ, in undisturbed area that dated precisely to the time where Hezekiah would have been king over Israel. But also you have the prism of Sennacherib that mentions a very important uh, aspect of this monarch against his campaign towards uh, Hezekiah. You guys remember the story, right? When they surrounded Jerusalem, they had recently conquered Lachish, and Jerusalem was next. And they came blasting and said, who are the gods who are going to save you from my gods? Nobody can. And, and Hezekiah goes trembling to the temple and afraid. And he says, God, how are you going to allow this? There's another version in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah intervenes as well. So this whole story. At the end, the biblical record says that Sennacherib did not conquer Jerusalem because the Lord was able to deliver Jerusalem from the, the king of the Assyrians. 
Well, if there was something that this monarch, Syrian, Babylonian, Egyptians, uh, lack was humility. I mean, that's why you go to some of the Egyptian temples and the pharaohs are depicted like this big and the enemies are this big. Because they like to boast, even if it was not true, they like to boast about the campaigns. The Assyrians did the same. In fact, there's a whole series of panels that depict how Sennacherib conquered the city of Lachish. And, and you can see the soldiers dying and going under the water and the arrows being thrown and the stones. And you can see the entire battle there. So they were not humble at all. However, Sennacherib and his prince, okay, it's a kind of hexagonal um, clay depiction of the uh, of case of Sennacherib. He mentions Sennacherib, I mean, he mentions Hezekiah, but uh, here's what actually says a translation from the princess about how he dealt with this king. So as for Hezekiah, the uh, uh, Judahite, who did not submit to my joke, so he acknowledged that Hezekiah rebelled against Sennacherib, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as small towns in the area, which were without number by leveling with battering rams and by bringing on siege engines and by attacking and storming on foot by mines, tunnels, bridges, I besieged and took them. 200, 200,150 uh, people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, sheep without number. I brought away from them and counted the spoils. So he's boasting about everything he's done to this uh, uh, Israelite king that didn't submit to his joke. But then when he talks about him, Hezekiah himself, he says, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem his royal city. And he never claims to have conquered or taken the city. There you have his secular account that obviously in the Bible, from the Hebrew perspective, God delivered. From Sennacherib perspective, he left on purpose. Because he will never admit that something went wrong and he couldn't conquer it. So he just caged Hezekiah and leave it there. <laughs> but in addition to that, we have what's called a silo and inscription, which has a very a nice connection to Adventist archaeology because the inscription was actually chiseled out from the Hezekiah tunnel and then it was rediscovered by Siegfried Horn the father of Adventist archaeology in the Istanbul Museum. So he was the one who rediscovered the inscription. Now it's in a very nice display in Istanbul. If you want to go, let me know. I'm going to set you up. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> the inscription uh, relates how the Israelite workers tried to build a water tunnel to bring water inside the city in preparations for the siege that they knew the Assyrians were going to carry out. So we have the Prism of Sennacherib, we have the Silo and Inscription, and they both do tell, correlate in this story. But there's another important seal that appears that is very important for this, for this area, okay? Now, the interesting thing about this seal is coming from the Ophel excavations, also found in undisturbed area, uh, pathological analysis dated to the 7th, 8th to the 7th centuries, and it tells has two words, belonging to Isaiah, and also mentions him as a prophet, a Nabi in Hebrew. So now you have two wonderful seals, again, the eighth century, belonging to the prophet, undisturbed area, and along with the seal of Hezekiah, now you have the seal of the king, and you have the seal of the prophet, did it to the right uh, in Jerusalem, to the right uh, historical era, contextual era, 7th seven, to 8th century, and also uh, being able to show proof that these two historical characters actually existed. And I continue to mention Yehu appears in the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser in a very humble way, uh, paying tribute to Shalmaneser III. So there you have evidence of this uh, king. And uh, yes, we do have challenges. But you can see my point. A lot of critical scholars argue, okay, 
that these stories never happen. And some of them claim, actually, claim with a lot of firmness that these stories were just ideological. Until more evidence surfaced, and then their old claims were challenged. So, yes, archaeology does not necessarily prove the Bible, because the Bible doesn't need to be proven. It's a book of faith. It's a book that people wrote about their experience with God. Like me today, I can read a book and say, you know, God delivered me from an accident. God show appeared to me in a dream. God did this marvelous act. It's a book of faith, of interaction between the created with the creator and how the journey is where, which now for us become a lesson in how we can shape our journey with God. Nevertheless, when I make absolute claims about the historical invalidity of the text, I better be careful because a lot of people have been proven wrong. And we have to remember the absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Thank you. There are questions from the audience. Brother Guy. A seal on it. Nope. There were several that had a seal. There, that one. Yes. Um, do you happen to know what the symbol, what the symbols in the center and to the right center of the right hand indicate? It looks yes. like a, almost like an insect something in the center, and then the one on the right is a symbol. So, we, yes, yes, yes I, I, I do. The, the, symbol, the, the, the seal or the bulla dates to the later part of Hezekiah's um, kingship. Okay? Now, what you see at the center, what you see on the, on the, on the side, on, the, on my left side, your right side, is an Egyptian symbol of the Ankh. The Ankh is an Egyptian symbol for life. You can see in a lot of Egyptian depiction as, for instance, the gods being giving life to a, a, a pharaoh. And you see this symbol presented there, you know. So it means, yeah, it has nothing to do with a cross. It's a crazy book somewhere out there that associates this with a cross and then the cross is a pagan symbol. Nothing to do with that, with that. Okay, just a symbol of life. And then at the center, you have to imagine this bullet like, not from a front of you, but from a top view. So what you see at the center is a little circle with rays, okay, implying the sun. And then what you see on the sides are actually wings, obviously pointing out to the, uh, the sun god of Egypt. So it's, there was a lot of Egyptian influence during this time uh, because, you know, you, ha you have new emerging powers. You have the Assyrians, and obviously the Assyrians were the power that you didn't want to deal with because they were nasty. I mean, the main, the main uh, form of uh, assuring power was to instigate fear, okay? So, obviously, the, the area of Palestine was more inclined to form alliances with the Egyptians that were more merciful to keep the Assyrians away. So there's a lot of Egyptian influence during this time in Palestine, but that's what the symbols actually mean. Any other questions? You can't do this on the Hope Channel. <laughs> Go ahead. Just a minute. At the very beginning of your talk, you noted that there was an inscription where most of it was apparently in black on a wall, but a portion of it was in red. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, which inscription? Ba which one? Way you back, this thirty one? slides before. Before or after? Oh, way before, at the beginning of your talk. Balaam. Yes, I think it was the, the Balaam. Oh, the, um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And so I just wanted to clarify, 
did I hear you correctly and did I see on your slides correctly? Yes, that some of it was actually in red. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's a highlight the, the, for it, modern. It, it is a highlight to highlight where we sh you have the name of Balaam on the very top and then the, the word prophecy in the Moabite script, Moabite script uh, on the bottom. So it's just highlighting where the words Balaam and prophecy are. Okay, so I was just wa wondering if that was original, how common that was, and this is just a modern yes. highlighting thing. Exactly, okay. yes. yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Can you go, can you go into a more uh, description about all the ash in Sodom and Gomorrah. How, uh, sure. how, is the ash still ash when they dug it up, or is it is it has it formed into something else? Or uh, no, it, it is. I mean, you need to remember. Let me go back to to Sodom and Gomorrah. Numera, we are almost there. This is the eternal house, we actually burned to. This is the cemetery. <clears throat> that's good. No, that's a, that's a pretty fire finding. So you see, you see there. So yeah, most, most of, of, of uh, this city, you know, they, they got destroyed, and then people, most of the time, they just be on top of the destruction, or they themselves destroy the city. So. And that's what you have what is called a tail or a mound, okay? Because you build on top, on top, on top, on top, on top, and then it's, you have these layers, and as you accept, obviously they're not like straightforward. Sometimes they just, you know. Um, so you go down. Whatever happens on the top then compresses what is on the bottom. And that is very nice because it preserves a small fraction of a history. So each layer contains ceramics, contains objects, uh, contains sometimes floor or surfaces like uh, uh, mud brick compact layers that uh, mud bricks actually walls have failed and were compacted. So all that creates uh, a stratigraphy, which is what we use uh, in order to be able to kind of tell the story of a site when it was occupied and which sites it was occupied, how many times there were reconstructions, destructions, and then destructions are usually identified by two aspects. One is an ash layer, okay? And it's still ash? Yes, it's still ash, it's still ash. And then uh, usually when you have a lot of mud, brick, compacted material, like very compacted, thick uh, clay, then usually that's, there was either a roof or a wall that collapsed, and then it got pressed down to form a layer. So. Yes, this is ash, and that tells us that there was a destruction by fire. Now, the impressive thing about Babadra is that the ash not only is very thick, but it's all over the place. I mean, again, with this, the site that I'm doing my dissertations, uh, Phil G. and Tal Jalou, so on the excavation of, of, of Andrews, uh, you know, I have destruction by fire, but the layer is probably 5 centimeters, perhaps 10 centimeters, at the most, you know, 20 centimeters. Um, but this one is over, over a meter thick. So, so this, is, this is huge. This is huge, massive fire. And that's why some critical scholars have said, you know, this, this fire is, is very uh, unique to this. This must have had inspired the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that, you know, was kind of exaggerated or uh, changed in order to favor the political rising of a nation of Israel. So, so following up, oh. Oh, I was just, is, it, is that thick layer of ash at both the supposed sites of Sodom and Gomorrah, or is it just, is this just one site? No, it is, in, it is, in, it's, it is thicker in Babadra. Okay. In Numera, I, I believe it's not as thick, but it's still there too. So following up on the questions about the ash, a very thick layer of ash, which is, you know, in, as you've pointed out, potentially 10 times thicker than the other site that you've worked at personally, 
implies that there was lots of fuel to, to burn to produce the ash. That then would imply that most of the structure, well, there was just a lot to burn. Mm -hmm. And if the structures were made of mud bricks or stone or baked bricks or whatever it was, that isn't going to burn because that's not fuel, that's mud or stone in essence. And so the question is, what has anybody studied the ash to try to assess what was, what was the material that burned? Why was there so much of it? Is that consistent with what is understood about structure, furnishings, and so on from that time period? Yes, uh, th that's, a, that's a very good question. Now, uh, I, don't f I, I don't recall any particular study that has been done on the ash. They, they, they might be. I just am not aware of it. Um, however, remember that the, the, the constructions or the materials used in constructions were not only clay and stone, they also used wood. So they would use uh, wood to be able to sometimes uh, hold some of the roof, to be able to hold some of the, so they would, they would use wood as well. And also you have other materials that could also serve as fuel, like clothes or anything that, like that the piece that I showed you of, uh, no, probably some kind of uh, fiber or something that, that was burned there. So that's, that's what you, that's what you have. So yes, we, you, you, you find these ash layers uh, in, in pretty much almost every single site has them. Uh, the only difference here is the kind of the thickness of, of the ash layer. Yeah, and then the, thick, the question about the mm -hmm. thickness is what would they have had that had 10 times as much well, that's, that's, combustible that's, material compared to your other that's locations. What impress, that's what impresses most, even the critical scholars, that is very uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's I mean, this had, to be, this had to be a fire that was actually burning the clay. <laughs> so it was... That's so, thought, yeah. yeah, so it, it was, right. it was, it was a massive lot. fire. So uh, yeah, that's why, like you know, most people, uh, it's called, I mean, the, 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 the scholar who takes the text as historical said, I mean, this, this fire is, is very unique, it's very, it's very towards this side, therefore, most likely this is the fire that was not caused by irregular, uh, regular causes, like an army coming and putting fire on it or, you know. Um, but so this fire probably, you know, is, is something that illustrates the story. And then the critical scholars say, well, yeah, we, we agree, it's unique, it's not common. Um, so most likely something caused it that we don't know yet. And, and they, you know, inspired, it was so huge, this fire, that it inspired the later story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we all, I guess they all agree on the fact, the uniqueness and the significance of the fire, they just don't agree on how to interpret that uniqueness and that, uh, that particular evidence. My question is a comment. Oh. The Elijah, Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal, and the water all over the sacrifice. It says in that story, it says the stones burned. Yeah, there's, so there's, there's, there's flammable material in, I mean, believe it or not, in significant fires, even stones may, may kill on fire. But it doesn't mean that we have stones in these ash layers. Uh, uh, it just, and, and there, there's males too. So there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that, that could have served as fuel as well. Yes. Yes. And all that, all that stuff that is there could have come from mom, could have come from the animal waste. Yes, ab absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of things that can serve as fuel. I mean, the, 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 these, these ash layers are all over the place. So there is, you know, if an army comes and can set a, uh, you know, a city on fire, uh, how much more, some, I mean, God can cause something significant, you know, even burn the stones. Uh, you know that you want to come back for church tomorrow. You, you know that. And um, I just I was saying to, to my friends at the back that this, uh, if, if you enjoyed this experience, uh, even, even though you, know, you may not have, ca have caught every word with, with his accent or you didn't know what BCE meant. What does BCE mean? Well, it's, an, it's before Christian era. Before Christian era, that's BCE. Well, before okay. common era. Before, before common era. Whatever it is, is before Christ. 
Okay. Okay. So, I was saying this is like a master's level class. Okay, this is the sort of thing that you're going to get if you are in seminary and you just get a whole lot more of it. And then you'd be asked, like he is being asked, to go and do your own research. So just know that uh, church, uh, we have the opportunity in this locale, in this local situation, to be that uh, group of people who would like to dig. And I don't just mean dig in Israel, but dig, dig into information and be willing to say that uh, even those who come from the minimalist perspective probably need to be listened to for why they say what they say and then you know we can be cautioned uh, to not be maximalists uh, where we're looking for the, uh, the the archaeological spade to confirm the word but that we're just going with the evidence that we see and uh, I'm, I'm gonna say this kind of tradition within Adventism has been something that has saved us many times from the embarrassment that others have have suffered because we have been willing to be uh, careful to do careful work and uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that, that uh, as Adventists we have that tradition it, it's Bill Shea by the way uh, he, he is a good Texan and uh, uh, is, is a friend of the family uh, and he, he was a cr incredible he studied under Albright, by the way, who has an uh, institute right there in Jerusalem. And I know that there are those of us who've been to Israel, and there's those of us who'd like to go to Israel again. Um, I just want to say that uh, Abe and I talked today about that possibility, and that we could potentially put on a, a uh, kind of a, an upper scale, an upper division trip, where uh, we would do some study before we go, and then be over there, be on the site, see, see things for ourselves, not just in pictures where other people are getting to see it, but actually see it for ourselves. And uh, see what it feels like. Um, as you can tell, it's hot, it's dry, kind of like Southern California in, in the summertime. And so we would know how to exist in those circumstances. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Let us pray. Father, thank you. We are inspired because you send your spirit. Jesus, you are with us and you are uh, able to enlighten us and, and you, you give us the opportunity because you were with your people during all of this and you tried very hard to use them to be a light to the world. Now it's our turn and we are asking that you would help to have a clear channel to us for the information we need to know for this time and place so that as people ask questions of us about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people of Israel, and the people of today, we can say with clarity, we believe in the God, the Creator God, who loves us and who is coming back to get us according to His Word, and we believe. Thank you for confirming that belief with uh, uh, the diggings of careful excavators, and we just ask that uh, as we move forward in the study this weekend that you will continue to answer questions and or uh, tease us with more questions so that we will get to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you tomorrow morning, and uh, we will praise the Lord together and learn more. Uh, we will be having fellowship lunch tomorrow, and we're not going to, Birker, we can record this. You said uh, we're not going to come back into the sanctuary after fellowship lunch while you're having dessert. Uh, I'm going to set up with, with Birker, and we're going to have the third presentation in the uh, multi-purpose room while you're finishing. Uh, Abe literally has to get on the road uh, quickly tomorrow, and uh, we're wanting to help him do that. And... Um, uh, not only that, but we're also wanting to have as many people uh, be able to be at the, the meeting without having to go home and come back. So tell your friends, and uh, it's going to be about David. I mean, this is, this is one of the f our favorite characters in the Bible, and uh, the fact is that uh, it took a long time.
for his name to be discovered and verified that he actually existed, but it's happened, and we'll learn how that all happened tomorrow afternoon. So thanks a lot. Amen.